Hello, everyone. It's Joe Lyons, and today I'm speaking with Jim Ford. Um, and I was just looking it up. Jim, we, we started corresponding, it looks like, a little bit over a year ago in uh, whatever the month seven is. What is that? Uh, not August, July um, of, of last year. <laughs> July. Yeah. Um, That's where we are. Yeah. So um, a year. Hey, happy birthday. Yeah. And uh, I, this, it looks like we actually started connecting through LinkedIn, if I remember right, um, it, it, it seems like. But um, you're, so, so Jim is That's over in China. Right. And um, I think because I had added you on LinkedIn, maybe that we started corresponding back and forth. And then we had some really good discussions. The happy news for me, which I know is, is, is a more difficult for him, is, is he's actually moving back to the States here um, this fall. So it'll be it'll be a little easier to have conversations in a time zone that's you know closer to each other. But besides that, the quality too and everything, right? Um, but um, why don't you go ahead and give us a little bit of a background of your education and your experience with programming? Okay, um, I'll actually start with the, the latter because uh, it's the longer back. Mm. I'll see if you can follow this statement. I claim because I've never found anybody who could tell me I was wrong that I am the youngest person who has been programming as long as I have. See if you can make sense of that statement. Youngest person that has been programming. Has been programming. Oh, okay. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Which means either A, you have been programming less time than me, or B, you are older than I am. Right. Right. Um, and the story behind that is that my father was a professor of physics at Georgia Tech in the 60s. Oh. And uh, he was actually one of the originators of chaos theory. Um, so if anybody you've ever seen that book by James Gleick called Chaos, he's all over it. Um, anyway, he had a laboratory and got a grant from either Department of Defense or Department of Energy um, to purchase a computer, which was a DEC PDP-8. And for anybody who was a historian, uh, knows that the PDP-8 was essentially the first port, I can't call it portable, but you could pick it up and move yeah. it around. Yeah. And um, Out of that, that, exactly. <laughs> um, and so he had that. Now, of course, it was attached, that's the computer. It was attached to a basic Bell teletype. Um, and if you've ever seen one of those large consoles with the machines and a paper tape reader that would allow you to write out your data or your program and then read it back in. Yeah. Uh, but by today's standards, this thing was a toy. Um, still, it was there. It was 1969, and I was eight years old. And one of his graduate students and I programmed uh, a little basketball game simulation for this computer. That's awesome. And uh, so from then on, I was hooked. And I've been working in computers or in IT or whatever they data processing, yeah. whatever they call it these days. Um, technology uh, ever since then essentially because while I, I played around you know off and on for, for that many for over the years around the age of 14 I was programming um, on one of the larger computers at tech and a graduate student came and paid me $50 to write him a program that would track non track particles along a nonlinear plane or something along those lines anyway he had the he had the formulas. I didn't really understand that, sure. but I knew how to program. And he paid me 50 bucks, and I said, this is stealing. <laughs> Clearly, I'm enjoying it. This is great. Um, yeah. and, and that was, uh, uh, you know, again, when we're 14, so uh, 1975. Um, and it wasn't steady work from then on. But along the way, as uh, you and I were discussing earlier, um, I started – we started actually that, that PDP-8 program was written in a basic uh, compiler they had. Um, and I didn't really ever understand the assembly language at that point, but I did then learn Fortran and Algol. And later on in high school, I got a job after school and uh, we learned, I learned COBOL uh, along with some other languages. Along the way, I learned APL and some other things that I've forgotten now. Um, but that has led to me over the years having learned uh, a few dozen languages. I think I wrote them all down one time. Um, and it, it would, which would include a number of different assembler languages. Um, but my, uh, my jobs have been kind of odd, but in the technology field programming ever, ever since, ever since a high school job after school. 
Um, but the technologies led me around led me around because I was more or less a uh, consultant uh, for hire even in my early days and so um, I ended up working on data general eclipse and data general nova and control data and univac and burrows which I guess became unisys and honeywell it was just a conglomeration of different computers running all sorts of different languages um, and I worked for the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta for a while. Um, I worked with a, a, one of the most interesting jobs I had was with a small accounting firm who was, uh, owned by a friend of mine's father. And if you thought I was the whiz kid, you didn't ever meet him. Yeah. Um, his, he was just a little bit older than me, um, and, but hadn't been programming as long. Uh, and, uh, we actually built like using, uh, I think it was a, a, a Z80 at the time. Uh, um, actually, the original program was with an 8080 uh, to build a, a computer that we would put in the client's offices so that they could enter the data for the uh, accounting ledgers and then ship the data over, you know, a modem. We really built the computer from the ground up. Wow. Um, I will say that, that project wasn't incredibly successful because we were just too early especially for a company of that size doing it. Um, but they were always on the cutting edge of, of things like that. Eventually they did put out a computer like that. Um, and uh, so I, I learned to program at a number of different microprocessor languages. Uh, cool. Uh, it, going, going from there, um, I got into the IBM world through Lucky Connections, that's really been my career is Lucky Connections, uh, where I became um, an, a database expert, a data, DB2 database analyst, also uh, their online systems, you know, CICS, um, and then the other things that go with being in the IBM world. Uh, from there, I went down to back to the PC, back to the small computers, uh, once they became viable with client server architectures with Oracle and uh, SQL Server, and uh, developing on those platforms. And then for a long time, I got involved with Lotus Notes. Um, I was working, uh, had moved to Boston and I was working with Lotus when Notes first came out. And uh, that was an interesting experience because it led me into the world of high priced consulting. Oh. Um, because I was working with firms like McKinsey and Price Waterhouse and Coopers and Librand. And even in the merger of that which became PwC, uh, I was involved in a project in which the partners were evaluated for how much of the sale price they would all get paid out. Um, but the interesting thing about Lotus Notes was it was less, there was technology involved and there was certainly development involved, but there was a lot of business process. And so I became a business process analyst um, sure. looking at how people actually work together. How do they collaborate? Right. Um, how do you use technology? Uh, traveled all over the world. Um, and so that was a, a nice thing. And then I just kind of uh, decided I had had enough after a while. I scaled everything back. Uh, I ended up moving to China for a completely different reason. Uh, been doing some consulting from here. Um, but then one day, about three years ago, I bumped into AutoHotKey. Oh, okay. <clears throat> um, uh, well, actually, so before we get into AutoHotKey, um, I'm trying to think if it makes more sense. But... Um, it is uh, since since I had forgotten, and, and when you started giving your story, I remembered we had this conversation like a year ago. Um, I, it all started coming back to me. I'm like, oh, that's right. I remember you, sure. you talking like that. Anyway, um, now I'm remembering. Like, going, okay, so how would you compare? Since you know auto, you know you're you're you've used Auto Hotkey. Compare the strengths of Auto Hotkey compared to any or all of the other languages. Like, what makes Auto Hotkey shine in your opinion? Like, what does it do? Why do you use it compared to other languages? Um, it, it, the, to explain that it might be useful for actually figure out how I got to auto hotkey. Okay. Um, why it showed up on my radar to begin with. Sure. Um, and I, I guess it's a slightly interesting, interesting, uh, story because I've always liked macros, yeah. the ability, because I'm kinding myself constantly typing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. And at some point along the way I had bought uh, a Logitech gaming keyboard, which was programmable. And I had used the programming keys and I had, they had like, I guess, 18 yeah. different programming keys. But if you yeah. held the control of the shift, but always remembering which one was which and the yeah. little code, they didn't even have a language. They just had a, you know, 
it was it was dumb stuff it was pushing it out yeah um and that thing finally broke and i needed i needed that that flexibility and i looked at a number of tools at the time that would just do hotkey type stuff yeah. and i kept hearing ahk ahk and for a very short period of time probably less than a week i'd said no i don't want to get that deep into something let me not bother with it but finally i said fine let me go look at it and it was everything i could have wanted and so much more yeah that's a good uh, and I, I know that we all who are auto hotkey aficionados or, or lovers have, you know, our default script that runs with us, the, our little companion right. uh, that, that runs along with us. And I bet my original one was 12 lines long. Yep. Um, and I had still used uh, a little tool that had like my windows keys mapped. Yeah. But I got rid of that and I added it. I would say now that my default program is probably 2000 lines long. Yeah. That's about what mine now, is. Whether, yeah. yeah. And now whether it needs to be that long, I could, and that's not right. counting the, 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 the scripts it's calling yeah. where I've, you know, pushed sure. them out to somewhere else. Right. Um, because it was everything I ever wanted to do. And I'll explain the statement. I'll let you ask some questions about this, but here's my tantalizing statement. Every annoyance I've had with every single piece of Windows software I've ever dealt with or any bug or anything else, I can get around it now. I can make any piece of software do all the things I always wanted it to be able to do. Yeah. And do it in a smart way. I mean, obviously. Well, intuitive to yourself, right? And that's, I think, yeah, the ability to personalize it. I can make it work the way I think, right? And, and yeah. I, uh, anytime you had a situation where there wasn't a short key to bring up the video sizing controls and whatever playback program you have, now you've got a tool that will do all that for you. One keystroke and, yep. and it's replaced something I do 50 times a day. Right. And was so annoying because oftentimes I had to use, you have to type something and use the mouse and type something else and then click like one button. I feel like uh, George Jetson. Yeah. Oh, honey. Yeah. Such a tarred day. I had to push two buttons today. That's funny. Um, but, but what's important is that the intelligence behind it, it's not just, I have, I still use uh, something called Tiny Task, uh, which does something strangely similar to AHK, uh, but that AHK isn't absolutely wonderful at doing. And that is Tiny Task does allow me to record a keyboard macro. I start record, I hit this, I hit stop, and then I hit play. But I don't use Tiny Task that much because usually I have, want some little bit more intelligence behind what I'm trying to tell my computer to do. Yeah. Um, and so the but still the whole key is to automate um the processes that i'm doing and while it, it started off that way what i've seen is that every time i find some type of annoyance or limitation in the way that any piece of software works i can write a pretty simple auto hotkey script that fixes that problem for me yeah um and and i know we we've had this conversation before but um Thinking about in the workplace, um, I, let's stick with this one because you, you mentioned it earlier and I was going to say to it, it's like there, there is the onus on, you know, one is you have to spot you're doing the same thing, the same actual thing over and over, right? And realize it where I think once you get used to it, once you're used to auto hockey, you think that way and you realize it. But my question is like, you know, why don't other people that do the same jobs as you, they keep doing it over and over, you know, and never even this is the part that drives me nuts is even when you, they see you doing it and they realize it can be automated. They still have no interest in like actually doing that. Like they, they, I don't want to say they like doing it the old way. Cause you can see they, they, you know, I don't think anybody could actually like repetitively doing the stuff, but um, they still stick with it. Right. And, and, it, and it's dumbfounds me that like other people, once you show them a little bit of auto hockey, they still, I'd say nine out of 10 for me, probably higher don't actually start using auto hotkey they, they they might use a script i gave them that says here you hit this button it'll do it for you but but why don't they start learning a little bit of just how to write their own code right that's what i i just don't get i i have to start you you have a i'm going to move the starting line back yeah uh I, i'll use my mother um who is not technically savvy but but maybe a good uh, average of the worker in america and i think she yeah. was certainly far more intelligent than most but um 
I ask her, she wants to go to Gmail. And she does this thing where she clicks this and then she clicks that and then she clicks this other thing and yeah. clicks there and then there's Gmail. Yeah. And I have tried to get her right down to there's a button on the, the there's actually a mail button on it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I have one. Yeah. Anything. And here's another icon. You could click it here. No, I like doing it my way because I know it works. And so you have that. You have, you have a number of things, but you definitely have that. People are averse to change of any kind. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I think I, made, I think I made Jay take a spit take there. And we need, may need to turn that into a GIF. Um, <laughs> the, so that's, that's one problem. And so if you look at, there's another one that goes, I mean, how many times has, I don't want to pick on your wife or my wife or anybody else, but I've, I've had it happen a million yeah. times to me where someone will say, will you go clean out the attic because I'm going to put a studio in up there? They bitch at you and bitch at you about cleaning up the attic. But as soon as you do, that attic stays clean and empty for a year. <laughs> they never pick up their yeah. end of it. Yeah, yeah. So there are many people who want to complain about the problem or want to absolutely put the problem in your lap. Yeah. But as soon as you have the result, I know this from being a consultant. This has happened oh, a million no. times to me. Yeah. Uh, the client is begging. Yeah. I want the deliverable. Where's right. the deliverable? Give me, now. you know, code yeah. or whatever it is. Right. You give yeah. it to them. Yeah. And, they and you're like, hello. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, but then oh, you yeah. give it to them and then you're right. So it's, they don't have a thing to say to you anymore because now the ball's in their court. Right. Um, and I have some consulting tips that I can teach you about how to use that to your advantage, but yeah. um, that's another conversation for another day. Yeah. So there's, there's another problem is the, the ability for anybody to take on the problem even after they've identified it as a problem. So problem one is they don't think it's a problem. I'll just do it this way. Yeah. Problem two is they don't want to own the problem. Okay. They want you to oh, own the problem. Yeah. And yeah. now you're actually asking for them to you know, yeah. you're trying to turn them into fix-its, Mr. Yeah. Fix-it, and that's never going to happen. Yeah. Um, and from my standpoint as a consultant, as a person who is always looking for value add for my services um, at a price, at a cost, then I'm very happy to leave them short of teaching them how to do it. I'll come in and fix your refrigerator. <laughs> I'll have to tell another story about an ex-girlfriend of mine who said we had had the refrigerator fixed. Well, what's wrong? What was wrong with it? I said, well, you got to understand that really with a refrigerator, there's only a single compressor and then the cold air from here. I don't want to hear all that. What was wrong with it? Yeah. And yeah. people are all- It was broken. With, right, exactly. Oh, yeah. okay. Great. <laughs> That's all I was asking. Yeah. Um, it ran out of gasoline. The, yeah. so, so you have that- that you know this this real aversion to owning the problem and certainly nobody wants to then become a refrigerator repairman they just want cold food and from that standpoint ahk provides the most perfect solution at least to a certain level which is the ability to turn a code into an exe file yeah so the fact that i don't even have to have you install ahk or ever even know it exists right i can hand you an exe called magic here just press the magic button yeah. And magic happens. Yeah. And that's as far as I would ever expect to take anyone because I've already shown you we've had enough trouble getting them to this point. Yeah. I'm not going to try. And I'm fine with them thinking that I'm, I'm, you know, got this glow around me that can make these things happen. No, that's, that's been, really, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. If I go back to my man. life, yeah. I was a computer guy in the early 70s, <laughs> back when Hal was anybody's. Uh, you know, reference for a computer, and they yeah. thought that I was, oh my God, this guy's brain must be a gigantic. Yeah. Of course, we all know it's just, you just learn some tricks. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I've dealt with people, I mean, it was lovely in the days before personal computers because people would go, oh my God, you're so oh, yeah. amazing. You do the computers, but I don't know anything about That's that, right. too. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Jim, can you yeah. come here? I've got a driver problem, you know, edit right. config.sys, all of that. Right. Right. And you know, I was like, "Oh my God!" Because I used to know the auto mechanic always had, or the doctor, and thank yeah. God I didn't have to deal with them. And now it's every day, and they won't even, you know, you how many times you give them the advice and they won't follow it, and they oh, call I, you back yeah. when it breaks again. Right. So we're we're right in the middle of this mess with AHK because you're pretty deep beyond what most people understand about computers. Um, yeah. And so I'm I'm 
I do understand why you can't get them to go to yeah. that level um, because I'm really focused on trying to get to step two, really, which is, as you had said, identifying the place in which it can make the most difference. Yeah. How can a little program, a, a few lines of code, save your organization, your group, your, your whatever it is, yeah. hun- thousands of dollars because we freed up all your little slaves from doing menial yeah. tasks on yeah. a Friday afternoon. Right. I think about the person who has to collect all the reports, all the files, and put them into some place right. with some thing and then ship it off and do that. And we can take that task and yeah. Automate take it. it away from you. Standardize exactly. it. It'll be more accurate, easier to do, faster. Yeah, so many benefits. Um, I had an interview with Tank. He, he's one of the admins in the forum, and he, he this is what he does. He uses, I think, it's automation in, anywhere or everywhere, anywhere I think. But um, you know, he goes into these large companies, and you know, the the license alone for the software is ten thousand per license, and just to do it each place, it's like Tank. You need you need three three licenses for the development and. Um, the live, and I forget what the third one was, but um, anyway, it's it's a big ticket item. But he he was mentioning like, as you, to your point, you're saying there is like you always have to go in selling them on the price savings. It's not the hey, it'll be more accurate. It'll be people will be happier. It's how much are you going to save? You know your company by doing this, and and I'm like, yeah, it it's tougher for me. And we've talked about this of like doing consulting and how do we. How do we get into, instead of the enormous companies, maybe it's the smaller companies, it'll be a little easier to get your foot in the door. But that's where it's also, it's to me, it's like, well, we're, you, you got to find that right niche of, because I, I was more of thinking of teaching them how to code, but with what you just said, it, it, it's probably more on the line of, I'm the magic guy and I can automate, I can create something for you. Um, and it's going to cost you X dollars, but it's, it's finding that again, uh, you got to do the math for them, right. And say, Hey, people are doing this much. It's going to save you 300 a week. And it's a, uh, you know, $500 to do it. And, you know, but in the, after a week or wh- whatever, the math has to work for them. But um, it's figuring that out of, of the right size of company that's going to have that conversation, which actually, so before I go there, cause that would be my next question, but um, getting back to the whole Man, this is the thing that, you know, I worked in corporate world for, for nearly 20 years and my managers, very few of them ever, some of them saw me as a gold mine and loved that I automated things, but the vast majority would actually tell me not to automate things. And they didn't go out and try to hire people who had any sort of that kind of skill set. And that was the one that that's another head scratcher for me of like, even if, even if you want to say the managers don't know how to do it, don't want to do it but why don't they hire people who, who have that skill set instead of having to pay consultants to come in and do it, right? Any, any insights as to, to that? The, there is, there's two different things you're working on. One is a, an individual mentality. The other is a corporate mentality. Uh, and in my uh, consulting days, one of the things I loved about being a consultant, uh, especially when I was being a far level, you know, executive management consultant, doing just a few days at each place. I got a great wide view of how many different cul- corporate cultures there were. Yeah. And if you went out to, you know, I've told you I worked for Lotus and I worked for DEC even back when that was um, there. But if you go to a company that's like that, that's high tech, they're moving forward. They're looking at options and solutions. They're trying to go. And then I'd slip into a place like um, John Hancock or the New England Life Insurance Company. And they know, they know they're here today. And yeah. They know they're going to be here tomorrow. Yeah. And they're going to be here the next day, whether I make this decision or not. Yeah. And the way not to get fired is not to make a decision. And that's yeah. just the corporate culture. They have people who've yeah. worked there for 40 years, who've never yeah. had another job. And they yeah. were the most difficult to deal with. Sure. It's uh, always. That not wanting to change. Yeah. And again, and risk involved in that one. You're right. The making no change, you're likely going to keep your job, right? You're not going to go skyrocketing up the, you know, your, but no, the thing is on those, which is your point, the, the, no one leaves anyway, right? So there's nowhere to right. go. You're not going to skyrocket because there's no positions because no one ever leaves. And so it's just easier to sit and do the everything else that everyone's ever done, you know, and borrow what other people, anyway. Yeah. And, and part of my uh, world was in, in, learning corporate culture and I've become 
hopefully some type of an expert in that, uh, incentives are important. And how do you incent the people to do what you want them to do? And most companies don't have any level of incentive at all. They don't really think about that consciously. But the companies who do are far more successful. Sure. Um, so are you, is your budget important to you? Is yeah. the number of hires you have or your, your head count important to you? Is, is quality for whatever reason important to you? You know, meeting deadlines, what kind of groups are, you know, every group is different, every company is different, every, but you didn't have the individual people, the individual players in this game who are going to make their own decisions and may or be mavericks in a slow company or ostriches in a, in a, in a short, in a small one. Um, so I don't know in any you know, apocryphal example, whether you're dealing with an individual's issue about change or yeah. understanding or whether it was the corporate. Yeah. You know, and if uh, that's praised in corporate world, then you'll see a lot more of those. Yeah. Um, mm. uh, I have a kind of a backstory to start on that. Cool. All right. So um, we were just talking a little, I had to pause it to do something real quick, but we're back. And um, we were bringing up, so when, when we're looking for, um, let's say to, to, especially, you know, we're trying to find and, and, and drum up work in, in using auto, auto hockey or whatever automation thing we're using, right? It doesn't really matter, but um, trying to help companies understand these are things that could be automated and trying to help um, because it, what we were um, talking about on the side was like, you know, I used to work in corporate world. I did the work. So I knew just because I'm lazy and I'm like, I keep doing this thing over and over and I'm going to automate it and then I can share with my colleagues and stuff. But um, if you're a consultant, right, how, how do you, do you rely? Cause one is if you rely on the company, people at the company to come to you, um, sadly, it, it seems like it's a rare occasion when, when companies actually realize something could be automated. I think it's like probably the, both mentality and skill and knowledge of the, the managers that just and their employees that just don't realize what they're doing could be automated. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Um, and it, coincidentally enough, when I'd spoken about Lotus Notes earlier, yeah. that was the same problem they had back then. They have this new tool, this new system, and the sales challenge was you had to explain to people what it was first. Yeah. Then you had to explain to people how you could use it. Yeah. And because it was a new tool that fit something completely different, finding applications for it was a bit of a challenge. Now, once you got to know the system and know what it did that nothing else did, you began to know what it looked like. Uh, but as a person who said, well, I don't even understand what this thing is. Now, how do I use it? You had to give them examples, but quite often our consulting engagement would involve going in and sitting yeah. down and looking Shadow. around yeah. and making up a scorecard about things we could do with it. And, you know, the knock sometimes was, isn't this a solution in search of a problem? Yes, but we will find a problem we can solve that you didn't think of solving. Would, so similar. Be before you keep, cause I, I want you to keep going down that path. Um, but what I was just curious on was that whole thing is, did you still wait? Did you wait for them to come to you with saying, hey, we, we want to save money and time and this and that? Or were you proactively going out and saying, hey, we have a magic you know, thing that we could actually save you time and money if you let us sit here with you? Or was it both? Uh, it was more like a fishing expedition. We okay. did a number of uh, industry conferences as notes experts. And so yeah. we were always looking to put ourselves in front of people saying, yeah. you've got this notes thing, now what do I do with it? Yeah. And it, we asked that question that people had and they went and we showed them what they could do and they, aha, yeah. they would usually come to us with something because we would seed the water uh, with some ideas, some general things, the, yeah. the questions to ask yourself. And they would uh, often come to us when, and, and this is a good example. I, I want to go into this, but then we'll go into auto hotkey. We, we named two things. One with, uh, with uh, notes was, an Excel spreadsheet that had gotten kind of overblown, especially if people were sending it around to make edits. We said, okay, if you've got that, we have a tool for you. Yeah. And, and a lot of organizations had that kind of things, whether it was a budget review or any number of other things or a help desk tracking, a small help desk tracking app. The other thing my, uh, my boss used to say was go stand by your fax machine and that'll tell you what should probably be in Lotus Notes. Um, because anytime you're faxing documents back and forth, between, you know, inside yeah. the corporation, then you're probably looking at something because notes have clearly had a document management. 
Uh-huh. So let's flip that to, to auto hotkey. Um, you're going to, you know, again, how the marketing works, I would suggest something similar, but I would also suggest maybe even something more stealth. Um, and we're going to go ahead and touch on something we did before and then come back to, yep. to where I'm to, to actually identifying applications. I believe that especially for auto hotkey, um, you're going to have issues in the larger corporate environments with any type of acceptance there uh, because of the um, security boards you have because of the standards they require a lot of different reasons and a lot of good reasons they have for not being quick to implement auto hotkey solutions. Um, There's a lot of other politics and governance that goes. And one of the great things about auto hotkey is how quickly you can call, you can get a solution. Um, I feel that most anything I can write in less than an hour. Um, And so you really are the magic man. So, um, if you are then having to pad that with thousands of dollars worth of other uh, sure. uh, containment and, and time, yeah, then then you've you've lost that advantage. So yeah. I have been strongly looking at the smaller market, whether or not this is, and uh, and I mean even down to individuals, you know, the Soho uh, yeah. uh, client, for a couple of reasons. One is they don't have those same requirements. They don't have an IT director who's going to tell them what to do. But if you can go in and give them a cost model that shows the benefits and actually even I've loved value-based pricing. I think that's the greatest thing that ever came along. I I think you have, Um, right? It's yeah. And, but because it's so cheap here, my thought would be to go in almost for free and say, fine, we'll, we'll write this up for you to get reference accounts, to do yep. other things like that, but to get that seed rolling. Because yep. once they see, once you have a champion on the inside you, you or them. a champion organization, exactly. Yeah, yeah you're a drug dealer. And, and yeah. you could do it at the credit card level or the, and I agree with you, you know, crack. Um, yeah. The, you, you know, if we're dealing with $49 apps, because one of the problems you've got, uh, you know, a lot of people we've talked in other forums about trying to productize AHK. Yeah. And I want to stop for a second and say, I'm, I'm one of the things that I learned in my career is there's a big difference between product companies and service companies. And I am a service guy. I know this product people are different. They just think differently. But the one thing you have to remember is even if you come up with the perfect product, what happens is you go from being a product developer to being a support organization. Yeah. Your help desk becomes your biggest problem yeah. uh, because now you've sold this thing and people expect it to work. Yeah. But I would want to sell under the, I do like the service model that comes with tools. I come and I have my toolkit, yeah. you know, and it's, it gets me there faster. I'm a locksmith. I don't come empty handed. I'm not selling you the locksmith tools. I'm using my tools. I'm selling you a lock, but yeah. essentially I'm selling you a security solution. Your yeah. And, and your skills and experience. Yeah. And if you need a new key, you don't expect me to give the key to you for free. You're going to come back and pay for another key. And I feel that the, the, what you do here with this model, at least at first, is you offer these things so cheaply that when, remember one of the things with, with any RPA solution is that if you upgrade the, the software, if I go to a new version of Excel, you very easily break yeah. the, the automation that I put on top of it. Yeah. Um, there's so many things you can do to break these systems. It, yeah. It's actually but kind of ironic. I've... I was just thinking about web scraping and stuff, right? And you're like, hey, you know, when the second that web page changes, right? And it's, the thing is, they know it's out of your control, right? So anyway, that'd be a, that's a good one because you know it's built in. It's going to change, right? And that's when you get them on the second and, one. You got addicted. Yeah. And, and that's, that's something that you kind of come in with, but hopefully you're, you're, you, know, you can be upfront about that, but you sure. say that's part of the cost because we're giving you this for $39. Yeah. Now, when it comes and changes again, yeah, you got to pay us another 25. But, you know, it's still just so little that you're not thinking about it. You're just like, yeah, here's a credit card number. I'm, that sounds good to me. And for us, the work's 10 minutes and yeah. we're, we're done. Not always, but, yeah, but it depends. Um, right. in, in, in many cases, I'm, I'm obviously exaggerating but the, the reality, the overall picture is, is real. Um, so there's a number of things you can do with pricing to bring it down underneath anybody's radar. Um, 
And we used to do that with notes. We sold the, one of the strange things that happened again with Lotus was Microsoft was going in up top and they were working down the IT directors and, and down, 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 push down and do down to the desktop. We, as at Lotus, we went in from the bottom. We looked at the person who was trying to solve the problem and said, here's the solution. Yeah. And we can do, 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 make it happen really simple. Yeah. I mean, it was almost, you know, play school level. And it, it drove the IT people nuts. Um, but it's another place where you can get in. And I wouldn't suggest going into, you know, Chase Bank with this solution. But you can go to the neighborhood ice cream shop, yeah. you know, who's needing to do whatever to take care of, you know, their systems. They've got somebody who comes in for a whole day on Friday to do this, you know, autom- to do this, to punch buttons. But really, you could have used a, a, a decently intelligent monkey to do the same things. Um, and I can definitely strip something in AutoHotKey that will, will do what you need to do. Yeah, greatly speed it um, up. Least, or, uh, again, and guess what? You're no of- longer paying. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I can definitely say, if you no longer need to bring in this worker who's costing you $400 a month, I know exactly how much money I'm saving you. So I would definitely look on the consulting side at what is the cost, what is the value proposition here? And I think you can put real numbers behind it because, it, like you said, they are going to see cost savings in reduced FTEs or whatever, however they, they budget those things um, and able to see the real result and you may have somebody who really does get it at a at a you know personal level and they would great to have a champion because you don't have to sell as hard to them right um but i do think that there is a huge opportunity here uh, specifically for auto hotkey uh because of its simplicity because it's free for us right. um now you know the the downside of that is um and another reason that i stay away from pushing auto hotkey is it's not for sale I'm not an auto hotkey reseller. You know, if I, if, if it was, then I have that extra thing, but I feel a little bad about that because now I've got a reason why I'm trying to get you to, to pave your road. Um, and with auto hotkey, if, it's good because I'm trying to get you to pave your road because you know, it's safer and people can get around faster and you'll get more money. And yeah. I feel like a good guy. I'm not lying to you about these things. This is real. Yeah. Well, and I can see you, you, you're as passionate as I am. It's like, I, I get so excited, you know, when I start showing people this, it's, 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 it's impossible for me not to. I just get so passionate about it. Like, this is, it's, it is amazing. I mean, it is. And yet, it's just so sad. Often the, the lack of, not caring, I don't know what it is, but interest. But again, I was, I was trying, I was trying to de-emphasize myself and say, look, you can learn this too. You can easily do it, blah, blah, blah. And that has, I'm not gonna say never worked out, but it's so rare where I, I you know, I hadn't thought of saying, no, I am magic. And, and you know what, you know, the, I am magic and you should, you know, be my friend and you should, you know, pay me, you know, and, and blah, blah, blah. But um, that probably would have gone with the flow, been accepted much more, you know, like, yes, I'm just magical and um, this is what I bring, right? This is my value. Um, in, in that there is a there, there is a strange unwritten rule in consulting um there's a big difference between the consultant who comes in for a couple of days and leaves and then delivers his report to the staff worker who sits and grabs a cubicle right next to yours and works mm-hmm. every day and one of the things is his magic your magic goes away with exposure yeah but if you come in and you act all smart show the slides walk yeah. away come back with a report my God, they, they think that you are wonderful, yeah. you know, and that, that is part of the game that, that the big, big six at the time, or I don't know what they are now, but McKinsey and company, you know, that's part of the way they play the game is to try to add magic into it. That's interesting. Um, sure. It's, it, it, they have to, right? I mean, unless they're charging those prices. much more, yeah, they, they'd have to yeah. charge even more to basically give away how to milk the cow. Right. I mean, um, and yeah, they don't want to do that. And the more, Right. And if you hang around with anyone for a week, they'll realize you're an idiot, which is true, but we just don't want them to know that. That's uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I say it like, yeah, it's, it's really not hard. The stuff I'm doing, it's just, you know, it, uh, it, it, there's some knowledge there, right? You know that, but it's still, it's, it's, it doesn't take a lot to start. Like, actually, it was interesting that interview would take for Automation Anywhere. He, um, he said for anyone who's interested in like working in that industry, in the RPA industry, he said, you know, they, they, they hired him. He had 
no experience with their software, but he got a job there just because he had a background in automation and, and you can easily start, he said, in the six figures. And I'm like, wow, that is, that is quite a statement. <laughs> um, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to completely dismiss it because there actually is some talent involved. And yeah. I was big on reading books about business culture and so business sociology. Um, and talent is the, one of those innate things, something you can't teach. It's just something somebody has, is, you know, yeah. like being organized. Yeah. Um, and for RPA people, there's a way we see things. There's a, you know, we see things that people really can't, other people can't see. Um, you're not going to teach them to see it. You can teach them to yeah. use the code, but you're not going to teach them to see I it. I agree, yeah. The same really goes for programming. There's many people who really can't program. You think it's simple. Many people can learn, but they never get it the same way a programmer gets it. Yeah. Um, where they see the problems, they see all, you know, they see the things they need to test. They yep. see the issues that can come up. They can design in their heads. It's yep. not the tools. It's well, not and then troubleshooting, right? It, it astounds me at the lack of some people's ability to just think through how would I figure out what you know, what what's wrong here? I mean, it's it's insane to me that. Which again, how do you teach that, right? It's it, it's not easy, right. but yeah. And, and if we go back to my idea of, I'm going to hang out in your organization for a month or a week, uh, and I promise you I will find a place that I can save you money. Yeah. That's not anybody can go in and do that. Even if we teach them, we can give you a week-long seminar, we can give you a month-long sure. seminar, you either get it or you don't. Yeah. Um, and th so there is some to that. But in the end, are the actual pieces involved complicated? Not at all, really. Yeah. Uh, but it's a way of seeing the world that we're seeing the process so that you can understand how to automate it. Yeah. I have thought of um, offering to go in more with executive level or, or somewhere and not executive necessarily, sorry, but at least director level up and up and saying, you know, can I shadow you and just watch what you do? And, you know, after one day I can give you some tips that will really speed up, you know, how you work. And that's not even using auto hockey. That's just looking at how they use a computer, you know, and, and, it's so crazy to me how people use computers. Um, they're so inefficient on average. And it's, it's just because for the most part, they never rethought like what they look at everyone else, right? And that's what they do. And then they never think about how can I improve this? Um, and I also think it's a bit of an untapped market because we're, when you read RPA articles and the one you sent me recently, is looking at that top 1%, those Fortune 100 yeah. companies who sure. I'm very familiar with. I understand these companies. Yeah. And I wouldn't, I think I've gotten too old to want to just go in to dive into that deep end of it. But I can see the way that we can save the, 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 the smaller fish. Yeah. And, and in, an, in a, what do I want, the word I want to use is that, that it, uh, you know, in a satisfying way. Yep. It satisfies you when you see the solutions you've provided. Yep. Um, and uh, sometimes it's, it really is kind of interesting. I I'll give an example that uh, in Lotus Notes, it's just a package I can use as an example here. Mm -hmm. There was this particular error message that would come up and it would say, this has happened. Do you want to do this or this? Yep. And the users never knew what the right answer was. Yeah. But there was always a right answer. It was always, no, do not. Do yeah. not do that. If no. I had an auto hot crease script yeah. that could sit in the background, yeah. see that message Watch and press no up. before you could read it. Right. And yeah. I can extend that to you, when you have people saving files in Excel, you want it in a particular format. We can yeah. do that. Sure. You know, how many ways your, you, your people are not understanding the messages they're seeing or what to do with certain boxes yeah. or making sure that certain options are set. We yeah. can do all of those things for you. Yeah. And this isn't saying, oh, we'll give them a hot key that turns on this and turns off that. Right. No, I've got one that's looking over your shoulder and making sure right. you don't screw up. Yeah. That actually, that's an interesting, right there, that pitch, right? You have something that happens often that shouldn't. Yeah. You can, you can have a, a robot basically watching them and making sure they don't do X. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm curious your thoughts just in general, because earlier you mentioned a very good distinction of, there are product people, you know, you come in, you, you create a product, but then you end up being, you're doing all the support versus the services and you're kind of in and out and you still have to, of course, 
support them to some extent, but it's, it's still, I understand the distinction. It's not, you're getting paid again for that. And it's, it's different, you know, each time you come back, that's, that's, you're selling your services that way. But, um, cause one of the things to me that I love are, are playing with APIs, right? And I think there are so many amazing APIs out there that you can connect and do stuff with. And I had thought of making, you know, software that would connect to some of these APIs and selling it to small businesses. But, but that, and that gets back into, I think you're right of like, well, then you got a product now that you, it has support around. Um, but do you, do you think that's something that is a decent area to at least still look into as well? Um, what's the benefits of doing that? I'm, I'm going scaling, to, I, think, right? yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to abstain from this one or recuse yeah. myself more, more in a way, but give you a little background of what my thinking is. Um, I came from the service industry and that's what I understand. That's what mm -hmm. I know. And that's how I feel. And then uh, I worked with a number of product companies, but the one I think of the most is Microsoft. Mm -hmm. um, so when I went in to start working with Microsoft, it was clear to me they had a different mentality. The way they thought about things, the way they saw profit, the way they, you know, their whole, their whole culture was just a different culture than the service companies that I came from. Um, and I will argue that IBM is a service company. They got this long before anybody else did. Yeah. IBM is a perfect model of saying, we'll give you the computer for free. Yeah. yeah. You can now pay for the software. Yeah. Um, and all of it had to be customized. And that's the way I always see it. I see it more as a toolkit. Um, because if you come, then auto hotkey is the tool. Um, but you're really the solutions vendor. Uh, you did ask a good question, though. I'm trying to, to rewind now to come back to, um, ah, is it the, the, the caution I have? And, and the first one is I'm not going to consider a product. I'll consider a tool that it comes along with my services, always knowing you have to customize it. So there's, mm -hmm. you're paying for the service, not the tool. The tool's free. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it's not auto hotkey, even if the tool is some base of code, some toolkit I've developed, yeah. that comes along with the services. Um, and... But a lot of people, and I've seen them in some of our other talks and, and seminars, you know, people, especially in the iPhone app or the even Android app days, people seeing Angry Birds as I'm going to go spend a weekend writing code yeah. and then I'm a millionaire. Yeah. And, and that's a fallacy. That just doesn't happen. It's very rare. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you can find, you know, even if you find the tool, somebody's giving it away for free. Yeah. Um, and... Also, even if you find the tool and now somebody's actually buying it, uh, they, as we said, we talked, now you've got to support them because they expect the tool to work. They didn't buy your services. They bought your product. And the customers have a different view of you mentally or psychologically as well of what they're expecting from you. And they are, many of them, expecting free support. And if you think people are not able to grasp the simple idea of us giving them a button that opens their email. Right. Think about now you've given them a whole spreadsheet and the level of support they want when it doesn't work. Yeah. I have sent some of the simplest code to people, even, you know, smart people. And how many times do you find that it doesn't work? It doesn't work on their computer yeah. um, for whatever reason. And clearly with, with, you know, any auto hotkey solution, that's all keys. It's got to work on their computer. Yeah. But um, and one of the challenges yeah. too. Even when, cause, cause often it doesn't work because they didn't launch it. Right. Or they didn't do, I mean, they didn't do something that was so simple. You know, you're dealing with people who just, they're just not computer knowledgeable at all. Right. And so it's no matter what, I, I get what you're saying. It's it, the amount of support that it's a lot more than what you would think. Right. Just because of, I'm not going to say dumbness, I, right. It's lack of knowledge. No, and it's not. I can turn this around and give you an example that recently I told you that I had uh, started to learn Python. And yep. the reason was that, that uh, I had, there was a utility that was going to do something I needed to do. Yep. And I found it on GitHub. I got pointed to it yep. and I downloaded it and I said, well, what's this? You know, I knew a, the words Python, but I didn't really know what the language was. Yep. But given my uh, uh, background, you can understand that sure. picking up, you know, your 50th or 55th language or whatever it was right. uh, really doesn't change much. Yep. And as usual, when I learn a new language, I'm deep in, deep in it. I mean, I, I don't start with hello world. It just never been my luck in life. I'm deep in trying to read streams that are coming well, in off, yeah. off, ser you know, uh, uh, off servers. And uh, again, when I downloaded the code, it didn't work. And it was because on my Windows machine, I've got Chinese installed. So I've got the wrong code page or not yeah. the wrong code page, but I've got a different code page than they were sure. expecting. 
And this is Python. This is supposed to be beautifully cross-platform. That's what they sell it as. But yeah. we were still having to go and deal with local modifications. Yeah. Um, and so one problem you'll always have with RPA in general, but certainly AutoHotKey is developing on not their machine. Yeah. Um, because even if they get version, the latest update of, you know, 10.1.1 right. of star X5, yeah. that's not going to run the same way as yours did. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you've, you do have those issues, but the product, going back to the whole idea of productizing it, yeah. um, I like the kind of hybrid approach with AutoHotKey gives you where you're able to create the EXE, make it look like a product. And right. that's where I think that in order to do it that way, you have to bring your cost down so low that you say, this is unsupported. This worked this afternoon, yeah. you signed off, we're done. Right. And, I, and I, I mean that, that's part of your thing yeah. is to say, if you need a change, it's well, another $10 or- yeah. Or even more, right? It, it obviously depends on everything, but yeah, yeah, it, that that's part. But of, you know, think of this as yeah. Which actually, I read. Yeah, a, we're selling really, you magic. No. Yeah, I I read a great book on pricing just recently, um, and and uh, it it talked a lot about how if you don't do what you're saying, um, people will always think it's going to be so cheap. Right. Or they have the expectation that like, hey, well, you sold me this product and it doesn't work. And now it's got, you know, you got to fix it. No, you're, you're, you're discounting your service to, to say, to get them to try it. But that discount, or you say you even put in, it's going to work for a month, right? However you want to agree to it, but you get it in the door for next to nothing, but you got to be very careful that they don't keep thinking that's the price point for what you have. Right. They get, if as long as they know ahead of time, I'm getting a, a discount. And, and that's, that price. is tricky. I haven't, But it was it was fascinating. Is that like a lot of business because you talked but to it's earlier? But more the mentality again of. Well, I, you talked to earlier about how when you do create products, there's everyone out, else out there that even gives them away, and how do you compete with free, right? And and it is it's it's really um, it's interesting, right? I think you're right. You got to go in. You can go in with the discounted price. Uh, yeah. Oh, definitely. And. Um, The, but the, the more is the mentality, and since I don't have the experience with this, but uh, you would want to make sure the customer's mindset was still that they're buying a service, not a product. And so, you know, your magic companion is not a product. I am, I, this is, I am providing you a service through magic companion. Um, but, but also just to reiterate, I mean, that, that they got to understand that initial price isn't a full price. It's a discounted price that they got just because they've never, they're not hooked, right? You're, you're the junkie you, you want them to be a junkie. You want them to get hooked, but um, they're hesitant to start. And I don't want, right. yeah. I don't want to jump ahead here. Um, and because I want to be clear, I haven't used any of these models. These are my starting points yep. and psychology is so strange that you'll find out that we're wrong all the way to ground, but these are the places I would start. Um, I would start with smaller businesses. I would start with, with free samples. Yeah. Um, so it's to see, to see how that worked. Well, and that's where, for me, that's why it, it just got back to also was the, um, it's not an issue. It's just in the long run, I wanted to be the guy that created the, what did you mention earlier? The angry birds, you know, I wanted to be able to create something I could scale right? It was my thing. But it, it actually doesn't have to really scale to that degree. But I've been talking with Jackie about doing stuff where we, we sell, like, basically, you um, sell um, information, right? You sell training on something. And, and that way, it can be out there. And it's a recording or whatever, or it's a pamphlet or whatever it is. But that way, you get people to, to sign up for it. Whatever, you don't have to be there. They go through the onboarding and they go, let's say it's a Udemy course, whatever, right? Whatever it is, they go through that process, but it's not each time. It doesn't take more and more of my time. Um, and that's the, the, the more of the issue I have when it's a service is you, you got to, you know, you, you got to be making money off of it. But I agree. The first one doesn't have to be. I, there's no problem with that. It's just a matter of then you can't scale it and uh, in there's no efficiency to, to scaling it, which, which is still fine. It's just, I'm at a point for me where I'm not looking for a, a job, right? I want, I want something to mm -hmm. where it, um, it can make money with, with little work on my end instead of working by the hour basically is what I'm trying to avoid personally. Um, but, but yeah. And, and the reality there is that's a difference between product and service. 
no. service is a by the hour or value based or something along those lines. And there's ways once you get to understanding your market really and getting your prices set that you can make money off of it. And the scaling is scaled by having bodies. It's a pyramid scheme, sorry, well, yeah. but it is. And you yep. end up on top of 300 consultants who are That's making right. you very rich. Well, actually, I was going to mention, you're absolutely right. You could hire people below you that are actually doing it. And now you're just your management and, and, you know, and everything else. And that, that is true. And so then, it, then you are back. And, and here, here, dude, is where you can start to be the guy you want to be, which is the, you can now have people who are motivated to learn auto hotkey because they're going to make money from you right. when they do. Right. <laughs> so you can be that guy you wanted to be. Right. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go back and touch on uh, another thing which comes up a lot when uh, anybody who's doing development comes in is why should we buy your custom packaged verse off the shelf? Yeah. And this is where RPA specifically for me really starts to um, whistle the tune that I've been singing all these years is there's a difference between buying the off the shelf software because you're going to do it their way. And what I'm going to do with my service is I'm going to come in and find out how you do it, yeah. really how you should be doing it. And then we're going to build software that supports that. Right. And yeah. this is where, and this is almost necessary with any RPA project. You're not going to find this RPA that fits sure. even two organizations, much less, right. you know, two any things. Yeah. Um, it's all custom. So that's your, your, your given, you know, right off the bat, that's it. Yeah. Uh, you, you can build some small tools, this and that, you know, we've, We've seen things built in AHK, uh, but it can be built in any other language. Um, and so I really see that the, it's exciting for me because it's a new market back. And this is, I keep bringing up Lotus Notes, but it was interesting because now we had this groupware. Well, what is groupware? We had to explain this whole entire segment of software and people in RPA are doing the same things. Yeah interesting what we're talking about is is actually talking a different dialect than the people have been talking so far because they have been talking if you're the cfo or cio of a large company this is what you need to know i'm saying if you have a computer this is what yeah. you need to know right if you have any technology in your group or organization yeah um, we're, we're here for you does right or not quite everyone and but it's pretty darn close honestly i haven't seen one word published on what we're talking about right now of, yeah. this, of looking at this segment of the market, partially because the big boys, who I know very well, are in there dealing with the top 1% because that's what they like. They're sharks and they like, they like the big whale meat. But, you know, we're smaller. You know, we're just bass here. Um, just looking to eat the guppies. And you can get full on guppies. Sure. And it's n far less stress. You and I have both been through a couple of careers already and are yeah. not looking to take on Wall Street. Yeah. We're looking to have fun and go golfing or whatever it is that yeah. floats your boat, scoop yeah. on the weekends. And this is an interesting, dynamic, fresh market with new ideas, new tools, things to be discovered about what we've been talking about, marketing, sales, pricing, yeah. uh, uh, staff development. All of this is, is brand new territory and that's got to be interesting or you're, you're, in the wrong, you're in the wrong business. By the way- um, This isn't interesting to you then- yeah, I um, and I can't. Uh, I'll have to search my emails because I can't remember the name of it. But it was a, it's a major company that I um, <clears throat> someone. This is quite a few years ago. Connected me with. They're like, hey, you might want to talk to these guys because because they go in to the C level people, and they right they shadow them. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Still can you hear me? So um, this company that, that um, I got connected to, a person that works there, it's this, it's this company that is really um, highly knowledgeable and, and aware amongst like C-level um, corporate people where they will hire this company to come in and show them how to, like, you know, it's stupid things, but like, you know, how to, how to not, you know, get through your email and, you know, and, or, or read your, your, yeah, basically you like other things of a uh, pick up a paper, don't put it down, right? Decide right then you know, and, 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 and basically, you know, get rid of the clutter. They teach them a lot of things about being more efficient. And so my friend connected me with them. And overall, I was, I was showing them at the time. Oh, you there? Already understand the solutions available to them. Everybody understands databases. Everybody understands being online. Everybody understands transaction security. Yeah. You know, these kind of things. Now you talk about RPA and they go, I don't get what? it. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, that, and also like I ran into that at work was, was um, often when I, or I, I even had a local company and you'll laugh at this because you're saying like the local, like, you can do this, you can offer. I offered to come in for free, mm-hmm. right? And to sit with them. And I'm like, just let me see your systems. Cause, cause I know they got emails. They, they have um, an Amazon sales store. And I'm like, I know Amazon has an API, but I didn't even go there. But I know they paid, it was like eight people full time to have the emails that come in from their orders on Amazon and to manually enter them into their database system to, you know, get them in the process. And I'm like, look, I can, I can get that down to one person that works part-time, right? I'm, I will bet you money that, you know, I can do this. They wouldn't even let me come in for free. You know, they just had no interest in, and it was like, I'm going, I don't understand like why I can't, even just like show up and say for free, let me just look at what you're doing. Give me two emails and an example of what comes in. I'll write it in my computer because they used Outlook. I'm like, I can write it in my computer to do part of this process. And then we can sit here and I can show you. And it was dumbfounding to me that like, what, where, why are you saying no? Like, what are you mm-hmm. what, afraid of? I don't understand. Yeah. And I think part of it, which I didn't apparently convey well enough was like, it, I think they had this belief it was going to be tens of thousands of dollars. Mm. Right. And it was like, no, it, it, it might be a, you know, somewhere between a couple hundred, you know, mm-hmm. to, to maybe a bit more, but it depends on the other thing is like, I don't have to automate the whole process. What mm. if I hit a button and it takes that email and transfers it. And then you look at it before you hit submit. Right. And that way there still has a human reviewing it, but it saves you 80% of the work. Right. And, and yet that would take me a couple hours, you know, to, to do, I mean, it's crazy. Uh, and you'll meet resistance. One of the issues of any marketing plan is you need to be talking to 20 businesses about the same thing, and you should be able to find two of them that would yeah. say sure. And 18 will slam the phone in your face. Yeah, it, it, It's just the, the way of all, all marketing. Well, um, actually, and maybe what you do is, if, if you can do it, is you schedule what, either a webinar or, or you have it in person if it's local. Um, you get several of them there. And then you say, we're going to take the first two people for free, right? And get them to feel like it's, hey, I'm going to lose out if I don't step up and do this. And if you see someone mm-hmm. else, right, I, that might generate more interest than doing them separately and, and battling it, right? Get them to, to realize there's value here and they don't want to miss out, right? It's that feeling. We like, use, uh, you know, brown bag lunches or even catered lunches that's as a marketing yeah. tool, um, yeah. they're excellent because you're, you're getting people who will at least... You're trying to get them the fever. Yeah. And, you know, the, the thing that worked for us in the past was when they do get the fever, they're going to call you. At yes. least they may call another person yeah. too, but they're going to call you to find out what you think. Well, um, so, so earlier you mentioned the whole, you're, you're, you're having to explain this whole category to people. Um, mm. and so, so my background's in research, right, in, in, in the um, customer uh, model. One, one way you can look at it is there's um, – uh, routine problem solving, limited problem solving, and extensive problem solving. And, and this, for them, is extensive problem solving. And basically, there's a thing called an information matrix, right? And the information matrix is, you, you, um, if it's completely blank, you're in the extensive problem solving. And that means you don't know what's important. You don't know how to evaluate anything. And you don't know who competes in it, right? And for that group of people, you go in, you don't pitch your company. You go in and just teach them, which is what you said, about the things, about how you evaluate it. Here's what can be done. You teach them why it's important, right? But it's a soft sell on your company. You don't push your company. You don't push your brand. But they, like you said, they will come to you because one is they realize you're, you're, teach, you're showing them and doing this. that You're an expert in the area, right? And they'll trust you. Plus, they start getting tied to you because you, you did this for them. But um. Yeah. And we, I'll, I'll throw in another tip for anybody who, who wants to take any of these ideas and run with them because I'm happy for anybody to do it. Uh, you, you did, we did what we always called, a, not a leave behind, there was another word we used, but the idea was um, make them an offer, uh, the copy of the slides or, um, uh, or any other, a white paper, something yeah. that you had done that would give them, yeah. as long as they gave you a business card. And there, yeah. yeah, you come out of it, you've got a stack of business cards, that's what you wanted to begin with. Now you've yeah. got a mailing that goes out. Yep. Or you've got a you know a feeler that comes back, and you don't you know hard call that. Nah, there you I'm go. Reading, I'm reading this book right now. It's mm. on on grassroots stuff, but that's that's some of the stuff they talk about was what you can do with that business card and so much information that's provided by when you get that um you know in bulk. But um, and they have right. a lot of great ideas. It's from the same author, Dan Kennedy. He has that book on pricing, which I, anyone that's doing anything with pricing, I, I highly highly recommend it. 
Yeah, and this is another place where pricing is very important because we may you may be underselling yourself. Absolutely, I think almost everybody is. Um, mm. And they talk a lot about how do you compete with free, right? And it's basically, mm. um, you know, add, showing the value. You got mm. you got to explain the value to them, mm. and you can group things together. But um, don't allow them to also compare. Like when I was at TI, we sold you know semi we sold you know, these parts that were a, a penny a piece, and they're you know uh, commodities. And they, they would have argued, don't, you know, one is there's so many things that like at TI, they don't obsolete parts, right? And mm -hmm. what happens if your part goes obsolete from your manufacturer and you got to redesign because of it, right? That's a big expense, right? So don't sell on the, the price, sell on the value that you're bringing that like we don't obsolete our parts, right? right? And then also tie it with other ones of grouping them together with other things that you, they can't readily compare. It's like, well, this one's giving us 10,000 of these, your price is 10,000. Oh, our price is at 10,000, but you also get a free X with it. Right, and it, it it stops that price comparison. Um, anyway, it's an amazing book on on dealing with price and how to better differentiate yourself um, and separate yourself. Um, and so many companies think they can't compete with Walmart, right? And and they're right. You can't compete with them on price, but you right. can compete with them on your value and your product and and change what it offers and show that it's not just most people are willing to pay more than the actual bottom line price once you explain why you're worth it. Right, and that—that's the key parts. Um, yeah, I—I have—I have. It's a strange correlation to make, but I know a number of people in the bar industry, and they open. You open up a bar, and you would think that price might have something to do with it, but it has almost nothing yeah. to do with it. You can give away your alcohol for free, and yeah. you may still be empty yeah. because what you're trying to do is get people to want to be wherever you know Exclusive. at your bar yes. more yeah. than somewhere else. Yeah, and how do you do that? That is not based on the price of the alcohol you sell. Yeah. Um, and people don't get that sometimes it's they, they all think even when they're in analyzing businesses that price is the main driver, but it's not. No, that that book it it was it was brilliant. I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. I, I think you'd enjoy reading it just just for sure. Getting that point of view of um and some of their ideas they come up with, and they actually argue that um most almost everybody's doing it wrong, right? You know, mm -hmm. and whatever you do, don't mimic what big companies are doing because more often than not. They have a whole other, you know, they, they do things wrong all the time, but they, they're big enough where they can handle it, where smaller companies, you can't afford to, to have a misstep and you're out of business. Uh, another thing that you, going back to the idea of uh, not having a lot of face time, you know, having that mystery. Uh, yeah. I, I read um, books on, on Elvis Presley, and one of the reasons that he was so popular was that Colonel Tom Parker kept him away from everything. He said no all the time. So when Elvis finally did yeah, show yeah. up somewhere, it was, thing. Yeah. it was big. But if he showed up every day at every supermarket, the value goes down. Yeah. Um, and so there is a, um, a real, there is the, the flip side of that, of giving it away for free, is to say, oh, no, 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 you're not good enough for me. Yeah. You know? oh, but but we, really, we really think so. Think about you know, a school, a kindergarten, that accepts everybody with a paycheck. Well, how can you say you're exclusive or top? It's when they start saying no yeah. to people, that's when they get to be, yeah. to have a reputation. What do you mean you said no? Well, now I really want in. Right. And, and so there is, there is that, but this is an interesting market. I don't know what will end up playing out with it because you've got that problem of trying to explain the solution. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah, it will the, the explain they even have the need right right i mean that's right. the part that to me i'm like because they just don't mm. see it mm. and, and that's that's when i think if we can crack because we can crack that and that is something i think we could we could have as a, a, a webinar or a training something to help say do you realize how much time is being wasted by your employees type thing um and and then give several examples um actually that was one of my other questions i'd love to ask you right now is sure. um do you have examples of using how you use AutoHotKey just to, so, to help people think about the various uses of it? I don't think that my examples are as good as what I could see uh -huh. um, out in the workplace. Okay. Because um, I, I understand you're, you're much more knowledgeable of the needs out there. So just go with that of like, what are some of the top things you would think that, that people would need, you know, could use AutoHotKey for? The... I gave a couple of small examples and they, they really were real, you know, any type of software that's giving this error message that's yep. causing your help desk to get called every 20 minutes. Right. You have some type of script that takes care of that or deals with that, or even presents 
another dialogue on top of Explaining. it with real words that explain yeah. what the world yeah. this is all Whatever about. Whatever you do, don't hit this button. Yeah. Right, right. Or, it, you know, it takes you away from there. Except for you, Fred, you're okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, yeah, except that it's Tuesday, so we, we put up right. a different message That's on right. Tuesdays. Yeah. The, the level of intelligence that can be placed around it is great. Um, but where I would really see it is, is in my leading question, I think, would be, do you have anybody in your organization that spends more than, let's say, two hours every week doing some type of repetitive computer process that's re that needs a human being because we don't have any other solution, but really doesn't need a an intelligent human being. And when and I'm sure you often have the executive secretary or somebody who is really has other things to be doing, yeah. is pushing a lot of buttons, getting all of these documents sent to the right people, for instance. Um, and when you if you ask the question a little bit open ended like that, I think there's better ways we can ask it. You'll find those processes. You'll find the, the low hanging fruits here. Um, but as we know, as soon as we get in, once, once our, one of our agents is inside your organization, right. we right. can find many more. Yeah. Um, uh, but the other, you know, the, the, the one I think about is the idea of, of, you know, you've got SAP and everybody knows, everybody's doing some type of SAP installation or maybe they're done by now. I've been left the States a long time ago. I hope they're done, but I had this feeling that they're not. No, it's still, yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, I think it was something like PeopleSoft where there was some type of error message coming up because people were doing the wrong type of configuration. And this was happening at the, the desktop. And they went to PeopleSoft and they said, how much to, to fix this? And PeopleSoft said, well, we'll get one of our consultants. Uh, we'll get you at $30,000. And, you know, they went, okay, because they're a big company and they're used to paying super off so many millions anyway. So, yeah. but it was, yeah, yeah, you know, we're not, we can't justify it for this. And so you go to the other consultant and you show him the problem and he says, you know, I can do this, uh, you know, I can do this for 10,000. And he says, okay, great. Well, well, why don't you do that? And then, you know, that person calls me and says, hey, listen, you know enough about PeopleSoft, let's work on this thing together. And I take a quick look at it and go, you know what? give me 30 minutes yeah. and I ship them over an AHK code and say, here, this just solved the problem. That'll be a hundred dollars. Yeah. And so he went from 30,000 to a hundred. Yeah. And by using, instead of trying to do it through Clean directly code, through people. So right yeah. Supposedly. We went in on the top and we fixed yeah. their issue for yeah. them because when this comes up, then it does all this other magic Yeah. and magic has now happened. Um, but it's clearly it, defining the end goal, right? Of like, well, what, is it's not necessarily that they they wanted to stop it's it's they didn't want the user to see it or whatever right it's they want to fix it but it's it can still happen as long as it's taken care of that's you know well there was an you know an enhancement of some kind to some reporting thing they had and there was a way of doing it in the tool but it required yeah some work doing this and yeah. well, okay we get we get, we have magic fingers our magic fingers take over your keyboard and your mouse and and they do what you need to do um, and it's, it's just such an interesting way of looking at it because for so long, like you said, we were looking at APIs yeah. and, and I've actually in a sense feel like I'm, I'm wanting to get away from that. I no longer care what your API can do because yeah. I can go through the front door. I can go right yeah. in and pretend that I'm a guy pushing the buttons and, and where your API doesn't support this or doesn't have the error checking mechanisms or whatever else I need to do. Yeah. I can certainly see, you know, auto hotkey and other tools can definitely interact with the software the way it is react to what it's saying to them jump over hurdles implement the corporate standards that need to be implemented and even provide you a report in the end so yeah. it's that kind of thing it allows you to solve the problems in a in a different way that is also simpler and easier and, well, and, cheaper. and typically much cheaper right yeah and and faster and you, right, right. And the, the downside, and, and I always feel, you know, I'm an honest guy, and that's always been my problem, especially in consulting, because while I'll go in and say, this will cost you $10,000, my uh, competitors go in and say, this will cost you 3000 and after 3000 they say, well, we right. need another two, and after two, they say, right. well, we can't get it done, and we're going to quit unless you give us the extra five. And right. I can't do business like that. So what's the downside to auto hotkey? The downside is, if something changes, it doesn't work. But because we gave you the two hundred dollar solution, you know, right. here's you know it'll cost you another hundred every time something happens. You're still going to be twenty years before you're at that ten grand number. Yeah. we had to begin with. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is actually that's just part of the selling. You have to ex really draw that out, 
right? right. Of, of say, well, this is your alternative because also even if it's not the 10 grand that they were going to pay people soft or whoever to do is, well, what if your employees still do it by the hour and how much time are they getting paid by the hour and how much does it save? And so like, that's the comparison, right? Of like, if you don't buy it for $200 and a hundred dollars every, you know, other month, you're, you're still spending an incredibly amount more, you know, doing it manually. Which is well, the- and, and value by, based consulting would actually, you know, if you can get into it, a deal like that, that's going to be your best because you're going to say, you know, okay, how much is your employee time worth? We're going to do some benchmarks. We're going to show you how long they're working on it. And then when we're done, we're going to do some new benchmarks and you're going to pay us half of that cost. Yeah. And we don't get paid until that second benchmark. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. That's a great, that is a great way to, to sell it. Right. Um, And then you, then you actually do have a, a stream of income, right? Because it's not just the one-time thing, right? It's it's an ongoing or can be an ongoing thing where you're still getting it. They still get the value, right? So they're happy. Um, yeah, I like it. And and you could certainly do some type of maintenance agreement once you got to understand what how complex sure. the code you had written was. Yeah. Fine, it's it's twenty dollars a month, and we come in yeah. and we fix whatever needs to happen. Yeah, uh, you know, limiting all the things you can limit, uh, but uh, it, it's. it's the windfall, there's a huge windfall possibility here. And I have no problem saying, you know, making more money, you know, if we look at it from an hourly rate, I just got $700 an hour. I have yep. no problem with that because I say I did deliver sure. on the benchmark that I, that I promised I would. Yeah. Well, and, and even and, then you, you leveraged, you know, years of training and knowledge to, to make that money, right? It, oh, oh, forget, I'm magic. You didn't understand that to begin with. I actually have magic. Can you be magic? Can you make this happen? Oh, clearly not. So there we go. Magic fingers. Yeah. Awesome. Um, we're getting a little, I, I've, I've, it's a great conversation. Don't get me wrong, but um, yeah. we're getting a little long. I think, is there anything okay. else you want to cover? I think we got it. I think we did cool. a good job with that. Good, really yeah. good start. Maybe we'll plan another because I know there were a couple where we said, here's some side conversations that we could have um, at some point, maybe, especially when you're back over here in the same time zone, we can play sure. more um, one-offs because it's a fascinating area. Um, it's fun talking to someone with your background um, in, in this to help talk, think through, you know, some of the, the issues that we'll run into. Uh, but awesome. Uh, well, I'll certainly be interested in, in talking to you more and talking to others more about this idea of, um, building service organizations around RPA, but specifically AHK, and specifically in this lower, less stressful, yep. less high bar um, right. market we've talked about. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said here because very little has been said so far. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for the interview. Thank you. And, and, and also thanks, Joe, for everything you guys do, for, for you do specifically right. for the whole group of us. Yeah. You're kind of the glue that keeps everything Oh, I don't we know. Orbit, so. But we, yeah, we, we definitely, you know, I'm so passionate about saving time and, and, and the frustration, right? Um, and, and that's the thing. That was where, and I'm kind of conflicted because I, I, part of me says you're right. Of like, I wanted, I've always wanted to help teach people how to do it. And yet I was always hitting a brick wall, right? It was mm. like, and it was frustrating because I'm like, God, what am I doing wrong? Right. Like I'm doing something wrong because they got to see how easy this is and how they can do it. And yet, like the adoption rate is so low. Um, But, you know, maybe I just put on my magic hat and say, I I am the magic. Right. And and when you think of magic, think of Joe and and I'll charge you and we're all happy, you know, and I'm happier. You're happier. You know. Yeah. It's it's I'll I'll give it some thought. Yeah. Joe. Uh, Joe Wizard. Love it. Awesome. Well, Thanks again. All right. All right. We'll talk soon. Okay, that'd be great.